So this is the Jaws of Victory by um, by New England Simulations. Um, got it set up over here, or at least I've got one map of it set up over here, and this has taken quite a long time to set up. Um, it's a complex game. It's a two-map game, but I've got uh, a seven-turn one-map scenario set up. The first scenario in the game. Um, which if I pan slowly across here you'll see the setup card for it here it's called Konev Springs the Trap and this is the second Ukrainian front attacking so we have a situation with a <coughs> grey German force that you can see in here spread around getting a bit thinner up through this wooden swamp up through there and they are being attacked by um, a large stack a uh, collection of Russians mainly based down here you can see all these big towering stacks here some under reserve markers and some um, some being released on future turns um, a major Soviet attack into this Corson pocket that's being formed here and if you had the west map over here we'd have more Germans defending in a ring around here and more Soviets pressing in from the other side and the the Germans fighting an increasingly tenuous battle to uh, not to get completely isolated and cut off and counterattacks and all kinds of hijinks going on but this is a seven turn game which is basically all about this um, amassed Russian collection of armies trying to break through um, the German positions and create um, the pocket of these northern German forces and separate them from from this um, 47th Panzer um, is it divisional corps I think it's corps yes each that's that's 14th Panzer division and um, and that's the corps designation in the top 47th Panzer corps um, up here we've got the 11th Corps as you can see top right and so that would be the 57th Infantry Division and so on um, all these units are therefore well pretty much all of them are individually named and um, uh, uh, yeah identified so you can see this engineer here 47th Panzer is a general a general core asset a 47th Panzer Corps 217 construction but if we dip into any unit at all, you'll find a very, um, you know, a very accurate unit designation for every last one of these. And what that means is that as you set this up, you have to find exactly every exact named unit and get it into every exact named hex, and that takes quite significant amounts of time. <laughs> Plus all the breakdown units and all the holding boxes stuff and all the multi-step armor units that can you know take casualties and be replaced with a lower with a smaller step loss unit plus all the stuff that has to go onto the um, onto the um, reinforcements track and you can imagine if this was both maps and spreading across 25 turns it would be a significant undertaking I'm, I'm fairly <clears throat> scared of doing seven turns of this but let's give it a go it does look like fun the um, components are amazing um, the rule books are beautifully printed on a on a really really nice uh, clean uncoated stock it's beautiful it's not glossy likewise with all the player aid cards on a on a really nice uncoated and un, un glossy card stock um, lots of lots of stuff with tracks on it which as you can see is taking up an, as much space as an, <coughs> another map sheet another reason why I went for a one mapper so that I had room to comfortably lay all this stuff out and keep track of the stuff on all these tracks um, yeah, oh and the counters, counters are amazing, counters are just really lovely, they are uh, a, lo a lovely, whatever the card they've used for these is really nice, it's got some nice heft to it, it's nice and thick, they clip beautifully, they're printed wonderfully, the colours are great, they are really, really high end um, stuff. So yeah, really enjoyed um, putting this together, it looks marvellous, the map's nice. 
Um, yeah. So we've got a, a operational World War II. What can you expect from that then? Well, we can expect supply to play a big um, part of that. And we can expect some fairly crunchy combat rules. And that looks like what we've got here. Supply in this game is um, different from anything I've seen before. You essentially get um, supply uh, markers that look like this. And they've got uh, a couple of numbers on the front which tell you um, what range they've got. Sort of These are multiples of ranges for frozen or mud conditions and that's the number of supply points it can hold and basically what you're doing is counting its range from a supply source in in those multiples and for each multiple above one you go it's the number of supply points it can hold is reduced by one so this is currently on three and i think actually where we're using um that's due to the setup but when if we were using those rules it would be on a four because it's right next to a rail station here so that would act as its supply source it would be within one multiple and it would have four supply points and you then use those supply points to um, attacking uh, to help attacking combat to um, resupply artillery with ammunition for engineering works um, and so on and so you can see all these all these supply things dotted around with the various supply point um, totals that the uh, the armies are going to be be fighting with. Um, they need to be on roads, and they need to be able to trace um, forward to your units to keep them in supply and back to to railheads or supply sources like this in order to um, draw supply themselves. So that's uh, a kind of halfway stage between the um, the sort of uh, really um, intricate or, or really involved and, and fiddly bean counting of OCS <coughs> and the sort of very hand wavy stick a thing down somewhere on a road um, abstraction of BCS so I quite quite like the look of this as a way of handling supply looks looks to have a nice level of granularity with about, without being silly fussy and but still allows you to look at the supply network uh, as a very operationally um, challenging thing so the Russians have to get road networks extended out of here so that they can get supply deep into the German position. They're also looking at this as the source of the German rail net as along with along with the two on the south edge, but that means that all that stuff up in the north area can be cut out of supply if we can cut the rail line coming through here and through Schipola here, um, which then which then feeds the whole supply network through this this town here of Signyevko. Well, if so, if we can get into here, you know, strike up this road, boom, and cut a supply through Shapola, that's putting the whole of the northern map area out of supply as far as these um, things are concerned. And then, as you might expect, there are all kinds of chromy rules about the... Um, about the Germans being able to declare, you know, course on an independent supply source and use the airfield to fly supply in and blah, 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 blah. Yes, the game has all that, but uh, our objective here as the Russians is to get as far down this road as we can, as quickly as we can, try and take Shapola, try and drive in here and um, try and make life really, really hard for the rest of those German forces. So, yeah, that's what we're looking at at the moment. Um, it's uh, the Russians to go. We start uh, having uh, missed out a few logistical steps in the turn sequence and the Russians have just formed two uh, major artillery units to uh, cause uh, to um, launch barrages with. So these two red artillery units are composite units actually made up of five individual artillery units and they're all loaded up into one big barrage 
and they get three barrage markers to lay down and then I'll be looking at uh, what the Russians do next which will essentially be to try and push into this area um, to try and knock this unit out and perhaps force back or cause as much damage as I can to other fringe units in this area and then to release these reserves to come and push as far through here as I can um, get them. I'm not sure how easy any of that's going to be but that's the plan and um, yeah let's give this a try. Okay we're underway here in Jaws of Victory. I've put down some barrages for the uh, Russians and then they've had a bit of a move but <coughs> zones of control restrict their movement <coughs> very much so they're, they're trying to break out of the of the German defences and having to declare combats to try and do that. Um, so we've just had a successful attack into this hex here which I've done the combat for which was quite interesting. So having had a shot at running a combat we attacked out of here and out of here across the stream and also not across the stream. Um, we didn't advance all our units into there in fact because um, it looks a bit of a quagmire with lots of units around it and in this game if you try and attack and don't attack into all the hexes that you're in as a, that are exerting a zone of control over you you're halved so um, uh, yeah there are rules about needing to attack um, to prevent uh, you know you can't selectively attack a stack when another ta uh, um, stack is exerting a zone of control of you without having a penalty so for example further down here we've got an attack into here which would be fine because there's no zones of control into into here but if this guy was just trying to attack into here he'd be halved because of the zone of control from this stack into his hex so you have to be um, yeah you have to be quite realistic in not just cherry picking targets and assuming that nothing else is going to get involved so yeah it's quite cool like that anyway um, we've run a combat down here and now I've got a combat in here where we're trying to break out along this this road towards Spola. So um, you can see we've you have to um, select all your combats first um, and then start uh, start resolving them. Here we've also put some uh, Russian combat air support in. So the first thing we need to do is um, spend supply. So we've got uh, two units attacking this. Um, infantry division from the 53rd army and this one from the 53rd army so that's going to be a supply point from the 53rd army required to supply this attack to support this attack and so we'll flip a supply from down there okay cool next thing the germans get to decide whether to put some air support in and for, for the sake of this combat they will so what you've got is a whole bunch of um mixed up chits um, and if you put air support in you get to pick a chit so the Germans will select that chit there no idea what it is so we just you must draw them from a bag or something but I just keep them mixed up in there so both the Russians and the Germans have got combat air support going in okay that's that done um, the attacker's artillery is already done because it's one of these special Russian barrages so you can see it's a three step barrage so that will give them three combat shifts to the right so that's done um, the Germans don't have any artillery in range oh they do actually no they don't they've, uh, they've got 5th Panzer has got some artillery up here but I don't think 5th think Panzer artillery can support the 389th Infantry Division I don't think the 389th Infantry Division has got any artillery in range so there's no German artillery support going in here Assault Engineers we've got none of that and the Germans could declare no retreat I think because they're in a village but they're not going to um, because it just means taking extra losses and they're probably uh, they're probably not too confident of 
it having any significant effect other than them having to take further losses. So what have we got? We've got a 20 strength infantry division halved for the river, we've got a 16 strength infantry division halved for the river and we've got a 4 strength anti-tank gun um, unit halved for the river. So 20, 36, 40, a total of 20 attack going into 5 defence, that's 4 to 1 as a basic attack, so we'll set the marker here at 4 to 1. And then we have got shifts for artillery, so we've got 3 shifts right for the uh, artillery barrage, puts it on to 7 to 1. Combat air support, let's see what we get for our combat air support. The Russians, oh, I'll, I'll put the combat marker back there so we know where we are. So the Russians are going to flip over their chit and have got, uh, that's nothing on attack, the red is your attack, one on defence, so they're on attack so that's nothing. The Germans have got a one on attack or a one on defence. So they've got one shift left on the combat air support. Okay, let's come back here. That drops us onto six to one. Okay, Soviet divisions generally um, give you a shift to the right, and in this instance, they do. Um, they, only, they only don't do that if they're halved for being in that zone of control of the unit that's not being attacked, or if their outer supply are extended or broken down. But they're none of those things. So they get a shift to the right, back to 7 to 1. Combined arms, neither side's got that. Armour superiority, there's no armour involved, no hilltops, no assault engineerings, and no outer supply effects. So we're just on the 7 to 1 column here. We roll two dice. There's no dice roll modifiers. And there's no um, messing around with armour here. So we just roll a 6 on our two dice. And a 6 is um, no effect on the attacker, step loss, a retreat and a breakthrough for the attacker, uh, uh, for the defender, uh, breakthrough. The attacking player retreats the defending player's combat unit two hexes, the advancing eligible units receive a breakthrough marker. Okay, so the attacking player retreats the defending player's combat unit two hexes and then we receive a breakthrough marker. So they're taking a step loss, retreating two hexes, and we get a breakthrough marker. Okay, that's a pretty good result there. Um, so I'll tidy this up, and we'll come back in a bit. So just so you're aware, I'm picking up little mistakes here and there. So the um, Germans should have had a plus two to their combat factors for defending a village hex, which would have put them on seven but I was able to rejig the Soviet attack to get them 3 to 1, which would have left them on with all the odd shifts and 6 to 1, and the dice roll result would have been exactly the same, a one step loss retreat breakthrough result. So we end up here. Okay, another thing that I've just become aware of, <clears throat> stacking limits are three units, generally two in a forest hex, but you can only stack a single uh, Soviet infantry division. And some of these, well, at least one of these attacks I'd lined up here had two divisions in a hex because <clears throat> I'd reached the stacking limits. So I've had to just slightly rearrange the uh, Soviet attack here. We've added an extra combat on the end there because we've extended our line further because we couldn't have the two divisions and so on. So just a slight rejigging to conform with the rules here, but nothing major. And essentially what I showed you was... Essentially what I ran through in this combat was pretty good. So we've got a combat down here. We'll carry on with the 53rd Infantry, the 53rd Army here. We've got an attack, a combat into here. So we have to use some supply. Let's uh, drop some supply from there to support the combat. <coughs> there we go. The uh, Germans don't have any combat air support to throw in now. <coughs> the attacker artillery is uh, three steps. 
so we know that the defender artillery um, what's in here is 47th Panzer so they can throw a point of artillery in from here in defence um, which they will um, so just if you look on the counter just quickly the counter has got factors um, here the artillery will provide two factors of support in attack but only one in defence range of three so they've got one point of defence from that artillery and with that they get a roll on their artillery support table because there's a barrage going in this roll has a plus one on it unfortunately so we roll a d6 for them, black dice for the Germans, they get a 4 plus 1 is a 5, they've got 1 artillery support and a 5 has no effect, so their artillery does not do them any good. Okay, we come back to our combat. We've got the three barrage points going in from the Russians, they have got a strength of, now you can see they're an A subscript 5 so their strength is they've actually got three steps from the strength marker underneath them uh, the subscript there with a strength of seven so they've got seven points they're defending a village hex so they've got nine points combat factors okay and the attackers have got just this stack here which is 16 anything else in there oh again as you can see I've messed that up because I've put two divisions in uh, so that isn't allowed <clears throat> so I'll have to rejig that and just move a division back so they've got a 20 strength they'll have the strongest division that they've got go that they've got available going in so they've got 20 strength going in to nine which is two to one <clears throat> so again come over here two to one is our base odds and then we adjust that for artillery the Germans didn't have any artillery support effect but the Russians have got three points of barrage um, the Soviet division is attacking that's an intrinsic one right uh, no combined arms, no armour on either side, no hilltops, no assault engineers, no out of supply effects. So again, this is on the 6 to 1 table, we roll 2 dice, we get a 6, and that is the same again, that is a no effect on the attacker, a um, one step loss and a retreat and breakthrough, so a 2 hex retreat and breakthrough for the defender. So let's work out what the Russians want to do there, because I'm not sure they want to pursue through the German lines here, but we'll see. So just run a combat in here, uh, the one with the black combat marker there. I've just run this and just wanted to illustrate how this is a fairly involved combat system in this game. So the defence in here, if we look, has got a tank with a white dot and two black dots it's got, I think that's a pound of four. It's got some combat engineers in there, all defending in a village. So they've got five defense. These have got two, that's seven combat factors. And then the village gives them a plus two for nine. They've got nine combat factors in there. We've got a barrage going in. I've removed the marker, but we've got two um, column shifts for a barrage into this hex. The attackers have got a 20 strength division and a 5 strength T-34 going in with two white dots as the attacking tank. So they've got 25 attacking across the stream, 13 against 9, 1 to 1 odds. That's the basic. But then the artillery barrage makes it 3 to 1. Um, the, so the fact there's a Soviet division attacking makes it 4 to 1. The Germans get a combined arms bonus of a column shift for having tanks and infantry uh, fighting alongside each other. That takes it back to 3 to 1. The Russians, Soviets, don't get that because they need actual um, 
armoured brigades to get that bonus but just tanks and infantry don't coordinate in the same way as the Germans so they don't get that but it's down to three to one however because they've got two white dots on their armour and the Russian, uh, the Germans only have one white dot on their armour the uh, Russians get armour superiority of one and that gives them a shift to the right and we end up on the four to one table so the overall combat is rolled on the four to one table but also um, the, the attacking armour having two dots means that if the Russian dice in the combat roll, the red dice in the combat roll is a one or a two, they inflict another, uh, they inflict a loss on the enemy armour. And the defender can total their white and black dots, in this case three dots for the Germans. Um, they've got one white and two black and they can inflict a loss on the opposing armour on a one, two or three on the black dice. So I've rolled out the combat and we've got this. So yeah, phone rang. Um, yeah, back to this. So we get a five on the die roll, but the two red, the Russian two, means they've beaten their one or two white pips and cause a armor loss. The black three means the Germans <coughs> beat their three pips and uh, uh, cause a step loss to the Russian armor. And the actual result of a five on the four to one table is a step loss either side, which will come off the respective infantry. So yeah. Just to show um, quite how involved uh, uh, a combat can get in this system, it's not um, it's not a simple process <coughs> to uh, to run through these combats. So it might get easier as you get more used to them, but I think there's always likely to be um, little bits of nuance in uh, going on. I mean, especially where armour is involved. So we reach the end of the initial Soviet combats. Um, as you can see, <coughs> um, they've cleared a little bit more space <coughs> and they've got all these units in reserve to come through next. But we've got these three um, units that ended up with breakthrough markers and they either get to fight <coughs> another combat or move a hex. Um, these two are going to fight a combat against this guy here and see if they can't just finish that so I mean or we could take the town here but I don't see any great value in doing that so let's let's just fight a final combat in here and let our reserves come through and do what they need to so we've got uh, 16 36 40 40 something um, actually, we could fight this guy in here and this guy in here, because if this guy, well, if this guy fights, he's going to be halved because he's in the zone of control of this guy with three steps. Um, I suppose halving him doesn't really matter. But if we attack into there, what have we got? We've got 16, 20 factors halved for half for the stream um, yeah I'm gonna give that some thought so we eventually decided just to um, attack the the unit in front of us um, irrespective of being in this design of control we took the halving we ended up with an eight to one attack and caused uh, and, and destroyed the unit. We did the one step loss and that allows us to advance into his hex and then one hex further. And we've therefore taken Kapitanovka, the two hexes of Kapitanovka here, cut the railroad and now have got our reserve movement segment to do. I decided not to do anything with the breakthrough um, here. He chose neither to move nor to attack, but simply to hold the hold the line in the front there so um, yeah now we've got the reserve movement and reserve combat segments to do with uh, these units here and this is similar to sort of exploitation in OCS so we've hit the end, <coughs> the end of the uh, Russian portion of this first turn <coughs> here with um, 
you can see the reserve, the uh, the units that were in reserve. We've got the 20th tank from the 5th Guard Tank um, Army here. We've pushed forward, nearly making it as far as Lebedin up here, not far from Spola there. <coughs> Wary of uh, counterattack by 14th Panzer down here. The f um, 29th tank army up here. Um, uh, is it an army? Anyway, 29th tank here guarding the north edge of the breakout against um, 5th SS elements of 5th SS Panzer that were lurking here. Most of their um, division is up here constrained to protecting the front but they do have a few units down here as you can see um, <coughs> and so yeah the Russians really trying to uh, just you know uh, create a create a wedge <coughs> in the German line <coughs> that they can pull more reserves through and aim to get up into this area so <coughs> that's where we are at the end of the Russian turn now the Germans have all kinds of restrictions. Um, they have um, things like uh, maintaining a continuous front, which means they have to they have to keep units um, next to this grey dotted line that demarks the front and runs all the way all the way around here along this sort of marsh and up there and so on up up here. So they have got obligations to may, um, to defend that front line even though we can see that there's not much in the way of, um, of uh, opposition threatening to break through. Um, they have some of their formations that are prevented from moving in turn one and others into a turn one and two. I think these guys down here can't move in turns one and two. Um, so yeah there are some there are some overlapping rules um, around what the uh, Germans are actually allowed to do. And there's a slightly confusing rule that says 14th Panzer can't move or attack east of hex row 45. And now 45 is this row here. Does, it, does that mean they can't move into any hexes to the left of that? Or, or, or can they move but not attack? Or... Uh, I, I'm not entirely clear what 40, 14th Panzer down here is allowed to do. Similarly, I think 3rd Panzer in here with this purple stripe on it are under similar sort of restrictions. Anyway, suffice to say that although the Germans have a lot of counters and a lot of units, um, they are heavily restricted in this opening turn as to what they're allowed to move, where they can fight, what they can fight and so on. They're also not exactly overflowing with supply um yeah they've got lots to think about here and it may well be turn two or three before they get uh, a, a feeling of having um their forces in order got quite a lot of reinforcements to come on as well over the first few turns if we look at these stacks here there's two stacks that will make the 11th panzer division in turns one and two then quite a substantial stack of bits and bobs in turn three and then they get another they get a panzer grenadier division in turn five and another panzer division in turn six and seven so that lot is uh, going to be coming on board as well anyway that's enough of this i'm going to um, stitch these together and send it up